my second year or first year I rewind. And then last night I got to do Coach Rickards at Harriman. So that was, it, you know, fun moment, fun times. That's awesome. Man. Yeah. It's always cool to have like those kind of full circle moments and everything. Uh, I was out at uh, Westlake High School, which is literally a stone's throw away from my house in Saratoga Springs. They were hosting Weber, so Region 1 versus Region 3. Fun game. Uh, Weber uh, ground out the victory and. It's just fun to be out there. It's fun to be out there underneath, underneath the lights, uh, trying to this time of year trying to avoid getting bit by all kinds of mosquitoes. It feels like, but <laughs> all the same, it's good to be out there with the Friday night lights, right? Absolutely. This is one of the best times of the year here in the state of Utah. Being out there watching some high school football, and the talent level has really grown. It makes it so fun uh, every year just to see the growth of of high school football here in the state of Utah. Well, okay, I'll tell you this much. I, I can point directly to that because I was at that game last night, as I mentioned, watching uh, both Westlake and Weber. I'm telling you, Westlake High School has got a 14 year old left tackle. He's a freshman, six foot four, 250 pounds, and I have seen the future. I'll just put it this way. <laughs> if that kid continues to develop, his name is um, Matthias Leilua, I believe, or no, Malachi Leilua. If he continues to develop, you're looking at kind of one of the next big linemen. He's in the 2028 recruiting class, Alex. He's a ways out, but it's crazy. We're seeing the talent level increase every single day. Thursday night, there was that opener between uh, uh, Sky Ridge and Timview. The Pula Twins, their 2026 recruit, uh, 2026 class recruits, they were balling out in a game that featured probably conservatively 10 Division One guys. So yeah, we're seeing the talent level go up in, in exponential ways. I'm so glad that we get to be a part of this and we get to be out there calling games and see that talent level grow. It's amazing. Yeah, no doubt about that. All right, so a lot to talk about ahead on today's show. We're going to dig into both uh, Utah and BYU training camps. Uh, Camps coming to a close. They will start to shift into game week mode. Utah's going to do that this weekend. They're actually practicing uh, today and tomorrow as they transition into game week mode as they get ready for their Thursday opener against Southern Utah. BYU will wrap up camp probably midweek next week officially, like quote unquote declare it closed, and then they'll get ready for their opener against Southern Illinois. It's about the two directional Southern schools in uh, for these two programs. But uh, you got another highlight of the week for us. It was really that. It was a Friday Night Lights for you. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to go highlight of the week, Friday Night Lights. Okay. It's just super fun to get back out there. Um, I had a little bit of the jitters heading down to or heading up to Bountiful. Um, I remember getting into the press box and, and our, our good friend Brian Brown was like, "Man, I'm nervous." And I was like, "Hey, dude, don't be nervous. This is the best. <laughs> this is the fun. Let's just be out there." Let's Brown have fun. Bear is never nervous. He's just playing you for a f- <laughs> no. I'd Probably love- Brown Bear. Brian Brown, obviously a good friend of ours, actually a former host of this show. Funny enough, way back oh, okay. when, so he's produced it and hosted it a couple of times. Uh, now we got Brett Hammer uh, producing for us today. Brett, you got a highlight of the, of the week for us. I have been waiting years for an album that released this week. Not sure if you heard, oh. but uh, Post Malone decided to just put the entire country industry out of business. I was, about, just, to, I was about to mention hey, this. I think I'm going to try this country thing. I might be pretty good <laughs> at it. I'm from Texas. I could probably do it. It just gets literally yeah. like every country artist, like new, old, oh, yeah. Dolly Parton, Hank Williams, uh, Hank Williams Jun- Jr., yeah. Brad Paisley, yeah. who I don't think has made music in a few years. Uh-huh. I've been waiting years for this album because I love Post Malone. So that's what you guys were doing last night. The album's what I was doing last night. Guess who had it as band of the day on DJ and PK yesterday morning? There we go. This guy. And then I was also listening to it to and from yesterday. I went to high school football. I drove in listening to it today. <laughs> F1 trillion. Are you an, are you a country fan, Alex? I dabble here and there. Okay. Not not re- not not as much as like Brett's not wrong though. Post yeah. Malone. Now Post has done every genre. It feels yeah. like at this point. He may have just taken the country genre by storm. And he, there was a quote I saw last night. Did you see this from 2015? He said, when I turn 30, I'm going to go be a country folk singer. And, well, he's 30 and he did it. And he's going to make gazillions off of it. He's been wanting to do it for a long time. Because, yeah. again, he's from Texas. Yeah. And I said this to my buddy yesterday. I don't know if I'm going to take a lot of heat for this. But Taylor Swift did the transition from pop to country. Yes. Or from country to pop. pop and yeah. I would argue what Post Malone did I think it's easier to go from country to pop than it is to go from pop to country and be good at it. I can say that, yeah. Well, yeah. let's let's not make the Swifties mad first thing Saturday morning. Let's do it. Come on, have you seen have you seen what you what kind of reaction you can get on social media? The clout <laughs> you can receive, <laughs> no. the hits are unreal. <laughs> no, that was my highlight of the week. F one trillions, the album title, and we're not paid to advertise for it, but it was it was awesome. Like I'm a big Post Malone fan myself, but this was like I'm like okay. 
he just proved he can do it yet again. So fun stuff. All right. Uh, let's dive in and talk a little bit about what's going on with both BYU and Utah. I want to start at BYU today, Alex, uh, because let's just put it this way. There is still no news on the quarterback battle. The longer this drags on, I feel like it's legitimately close and the coaches are still trying to determine where they go. Aaron Roderick said it on Monday and uh, I know Brett, you and I were out there and Aaron said that he let it, he'll let it ride as long as he needs it to. He has no deadline in mind. He said that back in the day, this is 2019, if I think my timeline is correct, there was a battle between then uh, Zach Wilson and Jaron Hall at BYU. And he let that ride. I remember I was covering the team. I, as I've done for well, 15 years now. And they let it ride until the week of game week. Three days beforehand is what Aaron said. They finally decided, okay, we're going with Zach. Now, that season featured Zach getting injured and then Jaron playing as well. But the situation is I think that they are going to let it ride and hopefully have somebody really emerge from the pack. My question for you is do you think they've already made their decision and they're just kind of just sitting on it? I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case, right? You know, if we, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago where even if you make the decision, it, BYU, BYU might hold those cards close to their chest, uh, give you that competitive advantage of, of, of just not announcing it, right, and just kind of letting us, letting us roll uh, into speculation until the first snap where they walk out, trot out the quarterback, and that's when we find out who QB1 is. <laughs> They've done that before. I wouldn't surprise me if they did it again. And I, it seems like that's the way they're going to do it. And and kind of based on the reactions of what we've we, what we've heard from from Satake and, and from the availability that he's been able to, he's been doing this week, it seems like maybe you know that decision. They kind of have that decision already in their mind. They just obviously do not want to, don't want to say it. They don't want to talk about it. Um, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. Okay, you had Brett pull a quote here because you believe that Kalani Satake may be annoyed by all of this. Sound, sounded a little, sounded a little annoyed of, of the on the. Tell me if you got that, Brett. I, let me know. But uh, the thing is, I, I here's the thing with Kalani. He is rarely a guy that gets super annoyed by anything. I, just knowing what I know about him. But this one, I, I know, I know the clip we're gonna play here. Well, let's play it and we'll react to it afterwards. Go ahead, Brett. I think he's in great competition. Right now, we're not we're not ready to make any announcement, but I think we have some really good quarterbacks, and those two have definitely improved since practice one to now. So, I think all, all the guys have gotten better, but uh, in terms of the quarterback position, it's it's hard to, to make a decision right now. All right, sounds a little frazzled, is what I told Jeremy. Frazzled. Yeah. Interesting. I look at it, and I think that Kalani he'd like to have it essentially decided. I think at this point. But I also think he is understanding that the bigger point and bigger picture is that this is a program that needs to win. So if it's not, if it's close and you're still trying to determine who it is, you, you let it ride and hopefully one of those two guys, speaking of Gary Bohannon, because Aaron Roderick said it's a two, two-man two race. So any hopes of McKay, Hillstead, Trace and Borgay, anybody else you have in your mind of winning that race, that's not happening right now. It's Gary Bohannon versus Jake Retzloff. I think the bigger point to be made here is they're trying to find out which guy gives them the best chance to win. But even then, my personal uh, opinion on the matter is that it's good to have two guys who can compete and y- you ultimately decide on one of them. If they're ineffective, then you pivot to the other guy. I think this is a race that is not going to be determined and settled for the entire season by the end of training camp. I think this is going to – you've got three weeks of the non-conference slate – I could see this race continuing to be, quote-unquote, be active through that, and then by the time that they kick off the Big 12 schedule against Kansas State, that would be September 21st, I believe, if my, my dates are correct. I think at that point, then you got to kind of settle on, okay, which one of these guys is truly the guy? And I think, you know, in that case, obviously, you have some advantages to it where – you get to see both guys in game situations because, right, you, you put the pads on at practice and, yeah. and, and things are still going to be different than how to what they translate to in a game. But it, it, it allows you the opportunity to kind of try out both Retzlaff and Bohannon in this offense um, prior to the conference play. Obviously, there's going to be a big emphasis for, emphasis for BYU on conference play this year because they want to be bowl eligible. Yeah. They, want to, they want to get those six wins mm-hmm. um, after kind of leaving with the – Sour taste in their mouth with that Oklahoma State game. Well, and that's the thing about this is they came very close to getting to six wins a year ago. Come on, a double overtime loss against Oklahoma State. 
I was at that Oklahoma game the week before that when it felt like BYU had them on the ropes. They were going to go in, score a touchdown, an ill-fated RPO where Jake Retzloff decides to pull it, throws it, it's a 100-yard pick six, and it's like the momentum flipped right back to the Oklahoma Sooners. They came very close to getting over the top. Had they gotten over the top and gotten those six wins, I think we'd be having a whole different conversation about this program right now. The, the, but the fact of the matter is they finish on a five-game losing streak, and that's – it, is, it doesn't sit well with any of us here in the media as we try and figure out what this team is all about. I can tell you inside the building, they've been hearing, speaking of the players, all offseason long. You want to go 5-7 and seven again? Keep doing what you're doing. They've been preaching these guys, elevate what you're doing. Work harder. The weight room. All the different things that go into being successful football players. And the ultimate judge will be what they do this fall. But... <laughs> I think this QB battle is truly one that they're trying to get right because you're right. They want to win. And they have to win. As, sure. As, yeah, they yeah. have to win. You want to keep, keep jobs. Yeah, you got to win. Especially after last season. Um, and look, you can look at the situation as kind of a, a half glass empty, half, a half gla- glass half full uh-huh. type situation where, you know, you can either look at the, po- the negative and say, oh, well, they lost five straight to end the year. Or you can say, hey, they came that close to being bowl eligible. Let's go build off of that success that they had last season, build off the good things, obviously clean up the, the hopefully the injuries. I think injuries played a big part in BYU season last year and see what they can do. Obviously, their 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 schedule is not favorable, but if BYU can figure out how to win in Provo and be dominant in Provo at home, those will get you the six wins to be bowl eligible. Yeah, I the the whole thing is, and trust me, I get people get mad at me because I've said that the goal for me, speaking of BYU, is to go to six and six. And they're like, "Well, that seems just absurd." I'm like, "Well, here's the deal: it's improvement, gets you to the postseason, and it shows that you're building towards something." I uh, there are there's a contingent of BYU fans that I think came into this league, speaking of the Big Twelve, thinking, "Okay, we've gone five and zero versus the Pac twelve back in 2021. We we've had success against Power Five opposition as an independent, and they thought they were going to be more competitive in the Big Twelve. I thought they were fairly competitive at moments last year, but as soon as injuries and attrition hit, and like guys like Ben Bywater went down, Isaiah Glasker, I'm going down the list, Keaton Slovis getting injured. Well, the depth was not there to be able to keep up the level of play BYU had, and as a result, you saw the slump that they had to end the season. So. The hope is that they've hit their recruiting trail hard, and Jay Hill has been very adamant that the freshman class of defensive players that they brought in, he thinks are going to challenge for time this year. And if the depth can hold up, that's the biggest thing for BYU. They're top-end players. They're straight across. They're equal with most teams in the Big 12. The problem is established Big 12-slash-Power 4 teams have got twos and threes that are better, or at least were better, than BYU. And the hope is, is using the transfer portal, player development and the like that coming into this year yeah your twos and maybe your threes are better equipped when injuries hit because my biggest thing about fans well the strength and conditioning have stopped doing their 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 job if they're injured it's a violent game folks injuries are inherent to the sport you have to have guys step up in those moments and if they can do that there's a pretty decent chance in my mind i think BYU can grind out six wins it happens you know injuries are part of the game and you know, you look at the you look. We talked about this two weeks ago, I believe it was Jake, where mm-hmm. we talked about the the depth that Utah has at the yeah. D line position, oh, and you were saying the way. that the three guys on the Utah D line were probably be starters at BYU because they need they need that help on the depth, and so it's going to take a minute for BYU to build up that depth that we're talking about. You want some? Uh, we're going to play this probably in the eleven o'clock hour. I talked with Lewis Powell, defensive ends coach at Utah yesterday. He says that he's going to have guys that he thinks could play for them on their varsity te- like var- so play in games. They'll be on scout team this year. Oh wow. <laughs> oh wow. Like, that, that's not surprising. I, it's not surprising, it's not but surprising. I I was like, "Huh. Okay, cuz here's the deal. With travel squads, the Big 12 uh, restricts how many guys you can travel with. So you have coaches will dole out, okay, you have X number of receivers and whatnot. And he I think Lewis Powell told me I think he has 6 Spots for his defensive ends to travel. Maybe a seventh. But he thinks he's got eight to ten guys. That means three guys are going to be relegated to scout team slash non-travel squad that he said, I, I think they could play in games for us. That's that's a luxury that few programs have. And that stands in stark contrast to BYU where I think the, I'd say they could go too deep right now at defensive end. That I would be myself comfortable with. 
Could I be wrong about that? Sure, because I'm not in the building every day. I'm not out there practice every day watching it all go down. But that, I think, illustrates the the growing pains that BYU is going through right now. I'm not saying that BYU can't become a Big 12 powerhouse in time, but much like Utah, where it took six, seven, eight years to build up, it's going to take hopefully a little shorter with transfer portal and the like, but if, like a five-year timeline for BYU to become far more competitive in the Big 12 and be towards the top, but that's if all goes well. The key word there is in time. Yeah. And I think fans have to give it a, just a little bit of time uh, in order for them to to get to where they want to get to. It's going to take a minute to, to build that depth. It's going to take a minute to have a deep enough team that – if your ones and twos get injured, your threes and fours are going to be competitive in the Big 12 as well. And like you mentioned, that's something that we didn't see last year with BYU is the depth just wasn't there. And so it's going to take a minute to build up that recruiting class. It's going to take a minute to build up that depth and have have that opportunity to to be comfortable enough to where your threes can get in a game and be competitive. Yeah, I, I just look at uh, the way things are going right now. These are two programs, speaking of BYU and Utah, who are on different timelines right now. Let's talk about the Utes for a moment here because the Utes are the Big 12 favorite. Like the, their, their whole focus right now is, yes, they're going to the postseason. But more importantly, Alex, they're looking at that college football playoff, the expanded field, and being like, all right, we have a chance to compete for it all this year. Injuries were their biggest weakness a year ago, and they still found a way to go 8-5. and five. And I will forever give a, a gold star to Kyle Whittingham for the amount of injuries that they dealt with last season and be able to grind that out. But should they stay healthy, I've got no reason to think that Utah won't be in the college football playoff, or at least in the mix, to be playing in the postseason at that level. I think a healthy Utah has a huge, huge ceiling, Jake. A healthy Utah should should be in the playoff. I, Yeah, I don't think we're going out on a limb with that hot take, but yeah. that's the whole goal right now for, for the Utes. Now, talking with coaches and players up there, Utah, and you've been up there a fair amount as well, is that they are all like wholly focused on that? Like they're they're all business right now. Oh, absolutely. They're- every every time we talk to them, every time we hear anything from them, they talk about the goal. Yeah. They talk about where they want to be. They, they they every player alludes to it. Every coach alludes to it. They say this is the goal. This is where we want to be. And that's in reference to the 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 college football playoff. They're not talking, you know, bit just Big Twelve champ or Big Twelve championship. They're talking college football playoff, and that is the goal for them. Looking at it, uh, Isaac Wilson gets the number two quarterback job. I actually was kind of stunned when Kyle Whittingham made that revelation because in stark contrast with what BYU's doing, Kyle routinely does this. Like, well, we're still evaluating it. We'll get back to you. We'll update you when we want to update you. And then he comes out and says, oh, Isaac's the number two right now. And I was like, oh, hey, look at that. That's really cool, by the way, to see a young man who's a true freshman who graduated early from Corner Canyon, uh, goes up to Utah, and has stood out so far, at least to the coach's comfort level, especially Kyle Whittingham, saying, you know, he's our number two. And that it sets up a future succession plan for Utah quarterback that I think is ideal because Isaac's a young buck. Obviously, Cam's in his final season of eligibility. That, in theory, puts Isaac in line to be the next quarterback at Utah. But I look at it, and I'm like, okay, that means to me, because the way that Utah typically operates is they're very close to the vest, that Isaac is really shining right now. And you, when you talk to the co- when we talk to the coaches and when we hear their, their availability, um, Whittingham and a couple of the other guys talk about how important it was for Isaac to come in in the spring. Andy Ludwig talked about it yesterday. And learn, yeah. learn the offense and, and figure out that offense, and, I th- and that's helped them tremendously to get QB2. Isaac Wilson, we've seen him at the high school level. Yeah. You've you've called him a gunslinger, and I, I he's a gunslinger. I hundred percent agree. He's got. He, let's put it this way: he's got a gunslinger mentality that very few quarterbacks uh, a get away with, and b have the arm to back it up. Does that make sense? Like, yes. And that's the thing about it is I think that the coaches at Utah are like, you know what? There's a little recklessness in him, but it's it's a good recklessness. And I know that sounds counterintuitive to say that. But he's not afraid to let it rip, and that there there's a there's a mindset you have to have with that, and I can appreciate it. I saw it with his older brother Zach at BYU. Zach had kind of a similar mindset, and the Wilson family across the board, Mike and Lisa and their kids, they seem to all kind of share that. Like, no, we're gonna go, we're gonna be it. We're we're the they have the quote unquote it factor. We're it, and if that's truly what Isaac has, good on him, and we'll we'll see what happens because. 
there's a chance he plays against Southern Utah in mop-up time because, in theory, you'd think that they'd roll out to a big lead, maybe get him in there in the second half. But at the same time, I don't think you want to burn his red shirt, so you're going to have to use him sparingly here. There may be a point in the season where Isaac gets demoted from being the number two quarterback simply because they want to burn a red shirt on him. Right. Uh, where either that is Sam Heward or uh, Brandon Rose who steps up in that circumstance. But for the time being, it's cool to see a young man like that. Who, yeah, he he's not the biggest guy in the world. He's got a big arm, and he's letting it apparently show off right now in practice. Is there any surprise that a true freshman is QB2? In some ways, yes, because uh, trust me, knowing what I've known of Kyle Whitting for years, I expected it to be Sam Heward. Like Kyle values experience. Like he values guys that he knows he can throw out there, and the moments, quote unquote, not too big for them. They've got experience at this level. Sam Heward is a five star prospect. Remember, his dad and uncle were legends at the University of Washington. The Heward brothers, NFL success for them. Brock is now a, a accomplished broadcaster Damon's still working with you with Washington and their athletic department as, as far as I know and he had a pedigree there I was like okay let's see what you can do he becomes the odd man out at Washington transfers down to Cal Poly and had a okay season a year ago but the thing is I, I looked at that as him coming into this program I'm like okay Kyle likes guys who have been at the quote-unquote big time who've got game experience and I fully expected it to be Sam Heward simply for that for that reason but when you have a true freshman in Isaac Wilson end up being that guy, that tells me that he is shining, truly shining on that stage. Do you think that says anything about Brandon Rose? Well, I think Brandon Rose is going to be transferring. I'll, yeah. I'll just be blunt about it. Like, he had his opportunity last year, and it was unfortunate. He gets an injury in training camp last year because he was the guy that they kind of had tabbed to be the number two. I know the Cam Rising, the whole thing last year, whatever. That's beside the point. They thought that Brandon Rose could be that guy. He picks up what ultimately ended up, I guess you can call it a season-ending injury because he never got back on the field in training camp. And that landed up with Nate Johnson and Bryson Barnes having to hold down the fort. But I think now if you're Brandon Rose, you're looking at, okay, I've got a true freshman who just passed me by in the pecking order. we got Sam Heward over here who was a transfer in who's got experience. Sad truth of the matter is he's probably the odd man out, and I wouldn't be surprised if he decides to move on. It's unfortunate. We heard a lot of positives about Brandon Rose. Yeah, they, and- we did. And But – it's the it's kind of the nature of this sport. Yeah. You, you, you got to put up or shut up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, heard a lot about him, and they were very high on him last season. And unfortunately, because of the injury, we just never really got to see Rose take the field. Yeah, so we'll see what happens. All right, we'll come back on the other side. Uh, we'll dig into more of the storylines around college football. Also, uh, NFL uh, tra- uh, training camps are well underway. They got the preseason rolling on. Uh, got some interesting games, some interesting comments, by the way. Zach Wilson going to be QB2 in Denver. We'll dig into that next right here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. Welcome back to the Saturday show here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. Alex Napolis, Jay Catch along for the thread on the sat- on this Saturday morning. Hope you all are doing well out there, uh, whether you're tuning in on KS- the KSL Sports Zone or if you're wa- uh, listening to us on the KSL Sports app. I actually found out not too long ago, apparently a very little listener who listens to us over in Europe. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> So we, I, I got a message. Not uh, this goes back maybe a month or two, and they're like, "Yeah, listen to DJ and PK. It's like midday here." And I remember which country in Europe it was. I think it might have been like Lithuania or something like that. But they're a Utah expat essentially that still wants to keep up to up to speed with everything going on locally. So they listen on the stream. So Shout out Lithuania! You can literally listen worldwide. That's the funny thing about this. So crazy uh, technology has made it where you can go anywhere and still stay close to home, as it were. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about what's going on with the NFL and some of the storylines involving the locals. Now, you just barely saw this. Uh, so Denver, obviously, a lot of fans here locally. Uh, what's the latest on that quarterback situation? Looks like the latest reports coming out of Denver. So we have Zach Stevens, reporter for DNVR over in Denver, uh, is saying that Bo Nix will be the starting quarterback for the Denver Broncos. Are we really surprised by that, though? No, I like it. He's a first-round pick. He's played a gazillion games in college. Like It just felt like it was natural that he'd end up being the guy. I know that they had Jarrett Stidham there, and we all know that Zach Wilson's there. But knowing what Sean Payton's kind of going through right now, why not throw him out there? I like it. I think it's a it's a good move. I'm a big I'm a big Bo Nix fan. I really liked what he did with Oregon. I really hope he can translate over to to this level, and I hope he can be successful because I am a I do like Bo Nix. I have one question about him, and I'll get your thought on this in a second, Brett. Bo Nix at times at Oregon, and I, I I don't say I watched every Oregon, but I watched watched a lot of them. 
seemed at times a little gun shy to huck it downfield, just to push it down the field. And we all know, <clears throat> watching what Sean Payton did with a guy like Drew Brees, is he wants downfield passing. He wants to go over the top on the guys. And that's that's my only thing with Bo Nix is, okay, has he finally decided, you know what, we're going downfield with it because it's a big part of that offense. Sorry, Brett, what were you going to say? Well, two things. First of all, the reason I'm shocked is because Sean Payton is like, Notorious. He's very for reticent, not yeah. wanting to start or play rookie quarterback. He's from a Bill Parcells era of co- coaching. Right yeah. now, if you want to argue that Bo Nix is 29, 30, <laughs> or thirty five or <laughs> BYU age or whatever, some odd games. yeah, yeah. Um, but to push back on your point about yeah. Bo Nix at Oregon, I don't know if you watched any of his game is at Auburn, but gun shy is probably the opposite yes. of the word that you would have described. So uh-huh. you, I almost wonder if it was like a, it was a, it was a co- overcorrection because his critique at Oregon or at Auburn was that he just threw way too many interceptions. He was way too reckless. His nickname was Bo Picks. Right, exactly. <laughs> so maybe the pushback is like, maybe that is an overcorrection yeah. and maybe it's toned down now. And you know, Sean Payton is not going to let that stuff no, fly. No. That, the thing is, Peyton is known as a quarterback whisperer, and he'll he'll either get the most out of out of Knicks, or it'll be quarterback purgatory once again for the Denver Broncos. That, that's where it stands. Now, to bring it a little closer to home, Zach Wilson, as I mentioned, is there. And yesterday, I'm seeing reports from multiple Denver reporters out there that Zach has really turned it on in practice. What I love about the NFL, and this is just awesome, is that they open up all of these practices to reporters. They open up to fans. Sends in stark contrast to a lot of college football programs who refuse to allow access, some locally. Uh, but the thing is, is that they they look at it as like, you know what? If we are the best team we're going to be, we're going to prove it on the field, even if somebody knows, quote unquote, what we're running. But the bigger point to be made here is Zach Wilson is starting to really come on strong is there a real case here, Alex, that he could be QB2 behind Knicks and let's say Knicks falters at all, that Zach becomes what he was kind of undermined last year in New York with by being that guy that every calls for to go into a game? I will say, and you know, if Christian was here, he'd probably agree, but <laughs> as a Broncos fan, that's probably what you want to hear. You, you probably want to hear that Zach Wilson is doing good and he's competing for that QB2 spot because one of the common things that I've seen over the course of this whole week, whether it's you know, local teams, whether it's NFL, is iron sharpens iron. I've yes. heard, I've been hearing that so much this week, and it just seems to be a, a recurring theme for me here. And that's that's what you want. You want Zach Wilson to be the iron that's going to sharpen Bo Nix and and vice versa. So for Zach Wilson to to be showing up, to be playing more consistently, to be playing better and competing for that QB2 spot, I don't think it's just going to open up the competition more for the Denver Broncos, and it's just going to allow your quarterbacks to get better. Well, I, and here's the thing about this. There's a, a perception, I, I'm a Niners fan, so maybe I'm just being a hater, but I felt like Denver fans have been expecting Sean Payton to be like, magic wand, it's fixed. That's a franchise that needs some time. We're talking about time for BYU. Denver needs some time here as well. Sean Payton is an elite coach in the NFL. You can't change my mind on that. What he did in New Orleans was absolutely remarkable. The fact that he won a Super Bowl championship with the with the, what used to be called the Aints, the, the Saints, is incredible to me. And you, it kind of proved to me what he is as a coach, his worth as a coach. I think given time, he will have success there in Denver. Now, obviously, it has to go with personnel moves. You have to have the front office working in concert with you. That's all TBD. But I think that Denver is on the right path here, and they're going to give Bo Nix an opportunity to prove if he's the guy, and he's played a lot of football. Trust me. Isn't he the most, like, started the most games at quarterback in college football history? I believe so, yeah, with all the extra eligibility. He's got a ton of experience. And I know it's the college level, I know it's the NFL level, but he's got experience playing the position. And I, I'm I'm interested to see where it goes, but Zach, if Zach can lock down that number two spot, that's a great spot to be in. I'll just point directly to what Sam Darnold's going through right now. Remember, Sam Darnold was like Mr. The Man when he was taken by the New York Jets, funny enough, all those years ago, then gets cast out on his rear end by the New York Jets because apparently the New York Jets don't know what they're doing. Uh, he goes to Carolina, eh, okay, goes to San Francisco and rehabilitates his image with Kyle Shanahan's team, gets a deal with the Minnesota uh, Vikings, and now J.J. McCarthy is going to be out for the season because he had to have a full repair of his meniscus in his right knee, but Sam Darnold's going to be a starting quarterback again in the NFL. 
That's what Zach Wilson's got to be looking at here. Is I'm going to rehabilitate my image, and I'm going to get another opportunity. And fingers crossed, at that point, you make the most of it. Because the Sam Darnold story is that he's getting the opportunity. Can he live up to it? Zach's got to be looking at that saying, okay, I hope he succeeds, so I have my chance to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, looking at the Sam Darnold situation, like you said, he kind of repaired his image at San Francisco. Now he has, he's been thrust into the starting quarterback position, uh, mainly due to that injury for J.J. McCarthy, but he has a big chance to kind of revive his career and Mm -hmm. say, hey, you know what, maybe I am QB1 material. Maybe I am franchise quarterback material. For Zach Wilson, I think it's going to be important for him to try to replicate something like that this season and and compete for that spot to maybe try to be QB1. If it doesn't work out with Bo Nix and you got to make some make some changes and shuffle things around at the quarterback position if you're Sean Payton, obviously you want Zach Wilson to to be showing that he has that ability and can do that so that way if he is thrown into that starting position, he has the opportunity to show that hey, he can revive his career as well. Well, and we'll see how it all goes because there, there's obviously a lot that's going to happen. By the way, on the Minnesota side of things, that injury to J.J. McCarthy, it, obviously being a first-round pick, you would like your guy to be healthy. But there's actually some good news in that for Jaron Hall potentially here because Jaron obviously was a four-man kind of racy quarterback. Teams usually carry three guys. Some have dropped in as, many, as low as two. That may make sure that Jaron sticks around for at least for the for, for the time being in Minnesota, and that's just another opportunity for him. I'm going to root for all these local guys. I don't care if they come from Weber State, Southern Utah. It doesn't matter where they come from. They represent the state of Utah. I'm all in on them. But the quarterback situation for Jaron and Zach, because that's the most high-profile position in the NFL, it'll be interesting to see how these two kind of work in concert with these two franchises because they're probably going to be QB2, QB3 for both of these teams. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, now with the J.J. McCarthy injury, Jaron Hall will probably be it, QB2 it looks that way, yes. under under Sam Darnold. So again, in a situation where it doesn't work out with Sam Darnold, Jaron Hall should be looking at that, doing his best in practice and in trainings to say, hey, if, this, if it comes to that situation where we need to make a change at the quarterback position, I'm ready and I want to take that starting spot. Now, uh, another quarterback who's competing for time is the man of the myth legend, uh, Tyler Huntley. Now, Huntley had a really good run in Baltimore. Come on, he got a Pro Bowl nod out of it. He's now in Cleveland, and I'm interested to see how Huntley does with Cleveland because he's proven to be a high-level backup. And when you need a guy to come into a game, Tyler has been that for Baltimore. Now, the funny thing is, is tonight it's Minnesota against Cleveland. Could we see Jaron Hall and, and Tyler Huntley head-to-head with each other? That That's a real possibility in this game, and I'm I'm curious to see how Huntley does with a new franchise. It feels like it's a good fit quarterback wise because what Cleveland does with their quarterbacks is like you need to have a guy who's a little more of a dual threat, similar to what he was doing over there in Baltimore. I am interested though to see how he does as he competes for time there in Cleveland. Cleveland's got a loaded quarterback room they, though they at do. the moment. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, there's injury concerns when you look at Deshaun Watson. Well, injury concerns and other things, but yeah. Yes, and <laughs> and other things and. But you have Jamie Swinston on that roster. You have Dorian Thompson Robinson on that roster. <laughs> DTRs there, yeah, I forgot about that. And Jeez. you have Tyler Huntley. Yeah. So that's a that's a stacked quarterback room uh, as far as as far as depth goes. Uh-huh. Maybe not, you know, guys who are going to lead you to a Super Bowl, but a good good depth in that quarterback room for the Cleveland Browns. I'm thinking there's going to be a trade there at some point. I just with that many guys who have reputations of being decent backups there's gonna be a team that has an injury that pops up here and it's like we need somebody cleveland who you got <laughs> give me Jameis winston <laughs> now i need famous Jameis. come on i don't know <laughs> i just look at this it's kind of an interesting situation because it's fun to see these guys getting their opportunity and we root for them to obviously have their opportunity injuries are a part of this uh like I said, Jaron Hall, he's getting a reprieve probably with the Minnesota Vikings simply because J.J. McCarthy's going to be on the shelf for a year. And that's that's disappointing because McCarthy just comes off winning a national title with the Michigan Wolverines and now he's going to spend his rookie season on injured reserve for Minnesota. That kind of sucks because you want to see what he could do along with these other rookies. The other thing is, is uh, the Patriots, they have their QB competition. Uh, Jared Mayo saying the, the QB competition, quote, definitely isn't over. Do you think Drake May is going to win that job? I think ultimately yes. Okay. I think ultimately yes, but I think Milton uh, Milton made a case for himself. 
That one's a battering ram. Did you see that run he had? Yeah. Where he just decided, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna run this dude over. Watch this. <laughs> we'll see. What, I'm just. It's kind of funny how things go in the NFL. Like there are quarterbacks who are like business decision, sliding, going out of bounds. Or those are guys thinking, you know what? I'm gonna just absolutely play like with reckless abandon here, and if I get injured, I get injured. I guess. I. I it's such a funny thing when it comes to the NFL, and I look forward to this. Now, the preseason to me, I don't know how big a fan you are of the preseason. I get so bored after like ten minutes. Uh, I, Brett, I I know you watch the NFL. Do you can you stand a full preseason game? Because I can't do it. Look, all I'll say is this: bad football is still better than pretty much everything. <laughs> I, I agree. So, but <laughs> I agree with you. Preseason is boring, but yeah. I'm also like, dude, it's been how long since we've had? Now, the the debate that you could have with me is: would I rather watch spring football or preseason football? Because oh, that yeah. to me is a close debate. But again. Some football is still better than no football. Okay, I will give you that. I will grant you that. It, it is football. And There's, like, nothing to watch on right now. Like, yeah. Olympics are over. I know we're getting ready for yes. our lives to yeah. just only be football. <laughs> and But, yeah, I there's nothing to watch when I go home at night other than preseason. So I had a Thursday night free. Okay. And so I, tur- I flipped on the, the Eagles-Patriots yes. preseason game. I was watching that for a little bit, but then I was like, oh, well. Not much is happening, and so I just decided to watch the uh, Sky, Sky Ridge Timview game here's instead. My, here's my proposal for what they need to do with the NFL preseason. All the games kick off at the same time. You go NFL Red Zone style. You can just tune in and watch. They just go like, Big players playing in this game, we're going to go watch them for a little while. Touchdown over here, we're going to go check out. We'll go quad box. You remember, you've watched the Red Zone. Do you guys do Sunday ticket? I've done it one time. I don't do it anymore. I understand that there's complications with the media rights and everything, but if I'm going to pay that much money for Sunday Ticket, tell me why I can't get the preseason well, just yeah. put on into there. It should be. Yeah, you're right. Like You're going to be spending a hefty penny to watch your team. Like, give you the I just – that's my thing. If I could have, like, a red zone style preseason where you have all the games – let's say they kick off – well, maybe you – kind of an eastern half of the country and western half where they're kind of offset maybe by a couple of hours or whatever – they all kick off at the same time, Alex. You have Scott Hansen over there sitting on. It's like who's the master? By the way, you watched you watch Gold Zone during the Olympics on Peacock, where he's. I'm like, Can you imagine how much prep you would have to do though for yes. like all of the six, seventh, but eighth string guys also to do if red there's zone? There's one person in this world that could do it. This is true. It's Scott Hansen. We need Scott Hansen preseason football. Save us. Yeah. Save us from ourselves. <laughs> Jump around. Hey. Jameis Winston's doing this for Cleveland over here. Tyreek Hill is doing this for many, and go quad box if you have to. Show me everything. That's how I would be able to sit down and watch more of the preseason. That because I don't. I just honestly, I watch like ten minutes and I'm like, snore. I'm out. I'm gonna go find something else. To, I I don't know. That's that's my proposal. Your thoughts? No, I I agree. I agree, and especially because I was watching that game on Thursday and literally nothing was happening. When Tanner McKee comes into the game, and I love me some Tanner McKee because obviously connection to the state of Utah, Stanford quarterback, but it's like, all right, great. We've officially reached (laughs) third string status. This is fun. I mean, hey, if you're a player, it's great. It gives you the opportunity to go out there, show what you got. They're trying to make bread. They're trying to live their lives. I get that. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) but for us, there's just – not much entertainment value to go off of. Now, here, here okay, we, I know we got to hit a break here real quick. It feels like we're going to 18 games soon. It does it, sound like it, it yeah. Just, it feels that way. Obviously, the trade off will be they'll take it from three preseason games to two. I'm in favor of, of it. Your thoughts? I'm okay with it. I know, I know, I know the players are upset about it. The only thing I think that also needs to happen with it, you got to have a double buy. Let, let teams have two buys during the season. Extend it out, or actually what you have to do, probably push the start of the season to the same week as college football. I know that the NFL's tried to be nice to college football by letting them have that first week. You push it up where the college football season kicks off. You have double buys built in. I think that's the, really the only way. But 18 regular season games feels like it's on its way. Feels like it's on its way, and I'm I'm honestly okay with it. And, you know, if we have to compromise a little bit and have both of them starting on the same weekend – even better for us. Yeah, more football. Exactly. Nothing wrong with that. All right. Uh, we will come back on the other side. We'll get to technical fouls, talk about some of the less favorable or uh, fun things in sports. We'll get to that next right here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. If you're coming from the street with dirty shoes on your feet, that's a technical foul. If you switch the radio to some modern music show, that's a technical foul. If you touch the thermostat, you'll get hit with a bat. 
Technical foul. 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 Alex, uh, how would you like to own the team that has been named the most unpopular NFL team in the world? I'd still own it. Well, I think we all would. It's, it's I would ca- still own it. I'd be, it's I'd a be cash cow. It. Yeah. Uh, but according uh, to the research from Flash Picks, a betting picks, parlays, predictions, and news brand aims to find the NFL teams with the most support from fans worldwide. Their analysis revealed that, wait for it, the Indianapolis Colts are the least popular team worldwide. Really? Okay, I can see it. So Jim Ursay. I can see it. Got some work to do to do there, sir. That's unfortunate. I like the Colts. <laughs> they got great uniforms. I'll say the Colts have an elite like that 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 blue and white scheme. Yes. It's really yes. cool. But yeah, so apparently that is the uh team that is the least. They were zero point five out of ten on the score from flash picks here. <laughs> oh wow. So there you go. I don't know. It's kind of funny to me. Uh the okay, second to worst, the Houston Texans edging out. The Indianapolis Colts by 0.1 points with a 0.6 score overall. So there you go. Uh, that, that, that'll that do it for the least popular teams, apparently, in the <laughs> NFL. The bottom five, as it were, Indianapolis Colts, Houston Texans, Washington Commanders, Los Angeles Chargers, and the Jacksonville Jaguars. The Colts have a Super Bowl. They do. And, the, like, the Texans, they don't have a Super Bowl. Yeah. I don't believe the Chargers. Chargers I, but, have been to the Super Bowl. I don't know if they've won one. Right. The Colts are... Have a Super Bowl, and they are somehow at the bottom of uh, a Super Bowl and Peyton Manning all within the last 15 years. Yeah, crazy. By the way, so they were like average monthly searches, how they were kind of doing this. Average monthly searches outside the USA for the Indianapolis Colts are 39,000 and change. The Texans who beat them out are at 54,000. So it's they do not get looked up very often. Indianapolis apparently is not where, not where you. Going for your for your news if you're an NFL <laughs> fan internationally. All right, so uh, so we won't see the Colts playing in London anytime soon. Is what I'm is what I'm getting from this. Well, they may want to play there to kind of up the <laughs> the search results here. But anyways, you got an NFL one for us as well. Yeah, we'll stay in the in the in the National Football League and we'll we'll go NFL. Uh, my technical file goes to reporter Steve Barton, sideline reporter for the I believe it was the radio st- um, that hosts the the New England Patriots. He was interviewing running back uh, Ramondre Stevenson, and he started the interview and just asked him, I got to ask you about the guy who just left. How (laughs) much are they going to miss him, and who's going to step up in his place? Very vague. Yeah, the guy who just left. Which guy? The three guys that got cut this week? Like, who? who would... <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Very vague, weird question. Yeah. And so Stevenson just replies with, I miss Bill. Um, one of my favorite coaches, but I'm excited for Mayo, and I think we can get it done with him. And so there was just like this like silence for a little bit, and he's like, I'm not talking about Mayo. I was talking about your defensive teammate. <laughs> and he's like, Juden. oh, oh, he's like, oh, Juden. And they're like, yeah, Juden. And it was just super awkward, okay. super weird. Technical foul for, for Burton for just kind of not even asking the right question. There's a thing called assumed knowledge. Yeah. If you're going to be a sideline reporter – Direct question: What do you what do you make of Matthew Juden leaving the team? You've got you can't say the guy who just left because that allows Ramondre Stevenson to take it any which way he wants. Even months ago, when Bill Belichick uh, was essentially st- separated from the man, come on now, yeah, technical foul on that reporter. All right, Brett, you got one for us as well. Tuesday was MGK Day at uh, Cleveland Guardians because MGK is from Cleveland. Yeah. Uh, he had a little different approach to throwing out the first pitch, and and again, this is a to Alex's point earlier. This is a glass half full, glass half empty, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, he goes to wind up to throw the pitch, and instead of throwing it uh, across the plate, he ran down the third base line and launched it into the stands. So you could argue he either didn't miss the plate because he didn't throw it at the plate, or someone has now passed uh, fifty cent for. The worst first pitch of all time. Depends on how you how you look at it. I'm with you on that. Like, here's the thing. Maybe he was like, you know what? There's not a chance I'm getting this across the plates. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to audible. We're we're, <laughs> we're going to go do something different here. But yeah, that's unique. I'll, I'll give you that. All right, uh, we got one more before we go here. Did you guys see the whole thing with Notre Dame this week? 
So Notre Dame has prompted, they've been prompted to suspend the entire men's swim and dive team for at least one year because (laughs) an external review found members of the team violated NCAA rules by wagering among themselves on the results of their own competitions and failed to, quote, treat one another with dignity and respect, unquote. They're running their own, like, sports book inside their own swim team. I'm here for it. When are we going to learn? <laughs> when are we going to learn that if you are an athlete, you shouldn't gamble? According to a person with knowledge of the situation, members of the team had set up a makeshift internal sports book where athletes could wager on the times posted by themselves or teammates at meets. Oh, geez. Athletes were not found to have bet on opposing teams or any other Notre Dame athletic events. The person said. I want to meet the athlete who proposes to his teammates first. I want to be there in the room. I want to have heard that pitch. Guys, here's what we're going to do. It's interesting that this is coming from the swim team. Of all things. And nobody at all was like, hey, are we going to get in trouble for this? Or they didn't speak up enough, apparently. <laughs> when are when are we going to learn? It's competitive motivation. Yeah. I. If you're an athlete, don't gamble. Okay, let me clarify one thing. The women's swimming and dive teams and the men's diving team were not found to have been involved. So just the swim team. Okay. Not even the divers who <laughs> are, you know, at their practice with the, like they weren't even involved in this. Been suspended for at least one year by Notre Dame. So lesson learned. One of the weirdest stories that's uh, coming out. <laughs> it's a unique one. I'll, I'll say that. Um, let's see. More than 60% of the returning team, which includes 25 swimmers, took part in betting on the performances of the members of the team. The review also revealed that some members of the team had bet among themselves on events such as the Super Bowl and March Madness basketball tournament games as well. So they really run their own sports book. Who's the bookie? Who's, who's the guys that control all the money here? Like who's, who's, setting the, who's setting the lines as well? And who's coming to check if nobody pays up? Who's the, who's, who's the captain on this swim team? I, He's the first person I'm looking at. Uh, crazy, crazy stuff. All right, so there you go. If you're in an athletic program, don't be running your own illicit sports book. <laughs> That'll get your team suspended for at least one year, but crazy, crazy times. All right, anything else anybody's got before we go here? All right, so we will come back on the other side. Uh, we are going to talk, we're going to head up to Utah football practice. Had a chance to have some assistant coaches yesterday. Uh, get you some insight on the defensive ends, offensive line, also the wide receivers. Dorian Singer, uh, one of the, I think, chief stars of Utah fall camp so far. We'll get into that next right here on the Saturday show. Don't you play me out. Welcome back to the Saturday show here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. Hour two of the program underway right now. Jake Hatch, Alex Napolis along for the ride on this Saturday. Hope you all are doing well out there. Uh, there you go, some F1 trillion from Post Malone there bringing us back in. So Clinto P can now get angry that we have now played country music. <laughs> Clinto, one of our, like, literally, like, Clint listens all the time, and I really appreciate it. Sorry, Clint. <laughs> Sorry for the country music. <laughs> Alex over here. <laughs> You get you and PK together. PK will convince you that country music is great. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't. Yeah. I didn't think. Uh, I didn't peg him for a country fan. PK is a huge country guy. Okay. Now, okay. we're not talking like Hank Williams, like that stuff. That's not his thing. He's in the Kenny Chesney, like gotcha. Old Dominion. But he and he admits it too, and I agree with this. It's pop posing as country in many respects, but hey, still quantifies his country because they're at the CMAs and all these other country music. Gotcha. All right. So, anyways, uh, let's talk Utah football for a moment here. You and I were up there at Utah uh, football availability yesterday with the assistant coaches. Just the second time these assistant coaches have been made available all training camp long. They were made available the first day of training camp. And now as they close out training camp this weekend, they also spoke to the media. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on, before we get into these interviews, what did you make of what was said from guys like Morgan Scally and I guess more importantly, a guy like Andy Ludwig? From Andy, sounds like he's very confident in this offense, which you should be. Um, a lot of it is going to fall, obviously, on Cam Rising um, and him leading that offense. But even then, they seem confident in the case of injuries. They seem like they're they're they have the confidence in the depth that maybe wasn't there last season. Yeah. And I think that's obviously that's obviously huge because we saw how much that hindered Utah season uh, just a year ago. It did. And he talked about how the offensive line is critical for that. I had a chance, I know that David James, I think I may have asked a question or two in this as well, to talk with Jim Harding, who's the offensive line coach. And 
well, I'm not going to spoil the surprise, but Jim Harding's very confident in what uh, he's got going on with Utah offensive line. So here you go. Jim Harding uh, talking with myself uh, yesterday at, B- at Utah football availability. How confident are you in your offensive line right now? You know, right now I think today I feel comfortable playing eight guys um, here in the you know, last three days of camp. And then when we start SUU prep um, to be able to get that ninth and 10th guy to where the backups aren't needing to be the swing tackle or the swing guard. Um, But I think we've made a lot of progress. We certainly have a lot to get, you know, get to improve upon, but I like where we're at as of today, but knowing that that we got more room uh, to grow. Philosophically, do you like to have essentially 10 guys where you can like for like replacements not having to have an eight-man rotation yeah sure, certainly if you had 10 guys that um you know guys six through 10 was the best option at for example right guard um and you didn't have to train the backup left guard that that would be ideal but the way that we structure practice a lot of times uh if we do have those situations where they're swing you know, a guard, you know, one period you might be a right guard, the next period you'd be a left guard. But hopefully we don't need to get to a point where we're doing that with any of our starters. You move Spencer Fano from left to right, and then you put Caleb Logan with that left tackle spot. Is that just a luxury to be able to say, I have two freshman tackles I can play? Well, I think, uh, well, both of them, that's their original position from high school. Um, I think uh, Spencer can play left. I like the idea of Caleb playing the spot that he is most comfortable to when you know when it comes to footwork and, and technique and, and trying to eliminate uh, multiple variables by him seeing a different picture on the right side um, during like you know some drills they will flip but for the most part they have um, stayed at those positions and they're they're both you know I was telling uh, the last guy I mean the great thing about those two kids is they. Um, They have a high desire to be great. I don't need to get on them to, you know, do extra work, extra film study, ask great questions, take notes. And I mean, those two kids have a, um, they're they're special, uh, both on and off the field. And and, uh, hopefully it translates to a successful season. Is there a set leader of this offensive line? I would say uh, probably Michael Mokofisi or or Falcon Kamatule. Uh, Falcon's a little bit more vocal than than Moko. Uh, Jaron has has done a nice job stepping up in terms of leadership but probably the alpha dog, how how the, the room goes would, would be Mike or Falcon. Right now, is the O-line better at either the run game or the pass protection? Uh, it depends on uh, the day, but I do think we're making progress. Um, you know, I know there was a lot to be said for the pass protection and things like that in the spring. I, I do feel um, that we're ahead in pass pro than where we've been. And, you know, I always, just as an offensive line coach, you always pride yourself on running the football. Um, I think I think we got some some athletic guys up front that, that can get some push, but we always are looking to get better. So I wouldn't say as of today one is better than the other. We talked to Andy, and he said that he's not sure if it's going to be a running back by committee approach or if one guy emerges. Do you have any preference one way or the other on that? Nope. Uh, I just know that if we're doing our job up front, it'll make the job easier for the guy behind us. There you go. Jim Harding. Confident in that unit. And I, it's crazy to me that they're going to play two freshman tackles, but that's how good Caleb Lomu and uh, Spencer Fano apparently are because they really believe in those two. I mean, we saw a little bit of what Spencer Fano has in his repertoire last season, yep. and I think he he emerged really, really well, and I think he's going to be obviously a staple in that Utah O-line for years to come. Um, but both Ludwig and Harding had mentioned that this O-line kind of sets the tempo for the Utah team, both on the offensive and defensive side of the ball. They are they're kind of the what what runs this team what what makes this team so successful and so obviously we're, we're going to be looking at the offensive line all season long to make sure that they they're setting that tone and make sure that they're the ones who are kind of leading um leading the physicality for this Utah team and and and, and of course like I said setting the tone for them yeah I, I look at it as this is a unit that understands that they are going to be that and it's an expression that uh former BYU offensive coordinator um oh now it Kansas, who was the guy? I'm, I'm, Jeff Grimes. Talk about the offensive line being the point of the spear is, is the term he liked to use, and that is exactly what I think this Utah offensive line considering like no, we're we're going to set the tone here. We're going to go out there. We're going to dominate opposing defensive lines. You heard him say that he doesn't care if it's running back by. He's like our guys as long as they're doing their job. Whoever's back there is going to have an easy day. 
That's Absolutely. And you you want it. That's what you want to hear. That's what you love to hear. Um, and not only if you're a running back, but as a fan. You want to know that there's confidence on that O line that mm-hmm. they're going to be able to not only off of course pass protect, but they're going to be able to open up the holes for your running game. Now they're being tested by a defensive line that is extremely deep. Uh, we heard uh, comments from Morgan Scally. He was talking about the fact that he's like, yeah, very confident in what this D line can do for us. Why well, I, I had a chance to ask some questions to a guy who. Apparently he's got enough defensive ends. He's got starting caliber guys who remain on scout team this year. So let's let you hear the conversation along with me and some of the media with Lewis Powell. You talked about having eight guys you feel like you're confident in being able to play essentially every down. Will you really rotate that many guys? Uh, I could only travel five. Okay. And if it allows me, I would love to play all five. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. No. <laughs> What do you look forward to most about the Big 12? Is it just the unknown of what you've known from the Pac-12 and going into this new conference? Yeah, I mean, uh, when it comes down to it, you know, there's a lot of different things that uh, every city brings, you know what I mean? And and I remember back in the day going to Wyoming, and depending uh, on the time of the year, it was either really hot or really cold. And then we got a little... A taste of of the Big 12 last year going to Baylor. Man, that was the hottest game I've ever been a part of. And uh, I'm just excited. I'm excited for that part, you know, to see we're not going to L.A. and we're not going to Seattle, but uh, we're we're going to some interesting spots. But uh, the one thing is those places that we're going to all love football. And uh, the brand of football in the areas we're going to uh, is different, you know, and 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 you know the, those places, Oklahoma, going to Stillwater, those play, places, they love football, and that's all they have. You know what I mean? So we're going to expect uh, um, it's going to be fun, you know, to expect and, 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 and see what we're going to gonna get. But uh, I'm excited. But it's not Laramie, at least. Not Laramie. <laughs> that brings a whole different type of excitement, yeah. Logan was having a great year last year before his injury. Do you think he's going to pick up right where he left off? Man, Logan is doing everything he can do. Um, he, he was limited reps early, and now he's just re- one of the guys rotating in. And uh, I'm really excited. He's gained 10 pounds, and uh, he looks good. He looks better than last year. He's moving around really well. I'm really excited for for Logan this year. And uh He's just overall just better than he was last year. Yeah. You talked about the styles of the Big 12 being a little bit, just a little bit different versus what you experienced in the Pac-12. We were talking with Morgan, and he said, hey, we can go from a 4-2-5 to a 4-3 look if we have to. Does that change anything for your defensive ends with the, with the linebackers shuffling in and out behind them? No, usually, uh, you know, we just got to understand if we're in nickel or, or 43, but mm-hmm. uh, it stays the same for us, right? We're still staying in the C-gap as a five technique, and, and then uh, we're getting after the quarterback it, when, it, when it presents us, but uh, to us. But, uh, yeah, right now it doesn't change much um, depending on personnel, but, you know, uh, per- different personnel bring different plays, and, and that's something that we got to be aware of. But uh, I'm excited to be in the Big 12 and excited uh, um, for our first year. We're talking to Morgan. He said he's a, he's happy with the fact that he feels like you guys have a four-man front that can get pressure without having to blitz guys. Is, is that the confidence level that you share? Like you, we're, we're going to get after the quarterback with our defensive ends? I think we have a, a veteran group, and not only our defensive ends, but our defensive tackles have – matured big time you know and and uh, they have a good understanding of of pass protection and and uh if we can stay with the four-man rush and get to the quarterback that's ideal you know we don't want our defense coordinator to bring pressures from different places and and uh but i mean there's a place and time for it but if he has comfort in uh, us just getting to the quarterback with four or four guys that, that's better overall defensive call for for our defense and not only our players but our defensive coordinator there you go lewis powell and he said i've got eight guys he thinks he can play he can only travel five defensive ends alex okay remember john henry daly a guy that byu fans are very excited to have on their defensive line paul fitzgerald had nine sacks a season to go at utah state those are the kind of guys that are running two and three on the depth chart right now that could be relegated to quote-unquote scout team status for this Utah defensive end unit. Having eight guys that 
are potentially starters are potentially at this level to be very good and very competitive and you can only travel five and moving them to the scout team that's insane <laughs> that is riches of depth for this utah uh football team <laughs> Yeah, and that's the thing about this is those guys could play at multiple universities if they want if they were elsewhere. So it's just crazy. Like, that shows you how talented, how deep that especially that defensive front is for Utah. And it's gonna be ferocious. That's the thing about this is they know that the Big Twelve is gonna require them to be a far more physical team, and they were probably the most physical team. I don't have a problem saying that in the Pac twelve, and that's how they won a lot of the games in the Pac twelve era. They're going to have teams that are physical in the Big 12 they're going to go up against, but having the just the power and the the bodies that they have, especially on that defensive line, they're going to be right there among the tops of just a team that can bludgeon you. And look, we've you mentioned it a little bit there with, you know, in the era of the transfer portal where it's so easy to kind of pack up your oh, bags yeah. and, and move on to another team, right? It's I think it says a lot about this Utah defense that these guys, not only in the case of Fitzgerald and uh, John Henry Daly, who decided to come to Utah mm-hmm. for this defense, but also just the ability to keep that talent in-house and, and help them grow in this defense. I think that says a lot about Scali. That says a lot about that Utah defense um, to have that depth that we're seeing on the defensive end. Yeah, it's crazy. All right, a position group that is – Routinely been panned, I feel like, when it comes to Utah, is the wide receiver room. Now, a lot of tight ends, a lot of depth there that obviously have taken headlines of late. Well, Alvis Witted is the wide receivers coach at Utah, and he has done a good job, you talk about the transfer portal, about bringing guys in that hopefully will make the wide receiver position great again in this Utah offense. So here's Alvis Witted in my conversation with him talking about uh, what he expects from his wide receiver group. How confident are you feeling right now at this point in training camp about your wide receiver position group? Uh, I'm confident right now as far as the progress that they're making and have made. I feel really good about uh, the depth that we have right now. And uh, I like the leadership uh, that's being shown by some guys. Mm -hmm. Every day is a work in progress. It's working to, to be as complete as we possibly can and get better. And guys have stepped up to the plate and I think the uh, cream is, has really risen to the top as far as the guys I feel like we can count on offensively. And now it's just about about us uh, battling ourselves in regards to working to get better every day. Philosophically, how big of a rotation do you like to have at wide receiver? Well, typically you want to have um, – you want to travel seven to eight. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and in any given game, you want to be able to rotate six, you know, six to seven. If, possible but um, you know obviously it's all depending on game plan and you know we've got great tight ends we got great skill great backs so that's obviously uh, going to be dependent on the plan the, the opponent who we're playing all of that but, um, excited excited for these guys really am and um, just hope we can continue to work and, and get better and challenge ourselves you know to be as complete as we possibly can. Dorian Singer's taken a lot of the headlines with his transfer into this program and what he's accomplished previously in his career. What is your confidence level that he'll be able to kind of recreate what he did at Arizona in particular here, if not exceed it? Um, You know, I feel like he's a kid that um, his football IQ and acumen is is really high. He cares. He works his tail off. He's great in meetings. He loves ball. I don't think there's a moment that's too big for him. And I think he's growing. I think he's growing from a football standpoint. Um, you know, obviously being in different programs and systems, I think the system, he's learning a lot of ball too. And uh, I really hope that he can take the next step, you know, in his personal progression and just go out and be the playmaker that we know he can be and uh, go out and make plays. Damian Alford's a really, really big body. What's his skill set? Is that to use his frame? Is that What does he do best? Yep, play strength, be physical, physicality, creating separation by virtue of his play strength, and then going up and uh, just making those contested balls. But uh, Damian can run. Uh, he's a sharp kid. Uh, you know, he's, been in a, he's just been in the offense where they, they don't huddle. They look to the sideline. They get a play. They go. They stand still. And so it's just been a transition for him in just the operation of how we go about our business here than what he did at Syracuse. So uh, I I foresee him continuing to to gain confidence and get better every day. Are you anticipating many differences going from the Pac-12 to the Big 12? Wide receiver, cornerbacks, you'll face that type of stuff? 
I think there are good players, you know, in, in every division, every school, every university. We'll face good players, you know, from a position standpoint. And, um, you know, the competition is going to be just as great, if not greater, in my opinion. Um, but at the end of the day, it's about how we go about our business, what we control, how, how we go about practice every day. And, um, yeah, that's really it, man. Last thing for me is I just want to ask you, in terms of now as you approach getting into game prep mode, what do you want to see most from your guys as you move forward here? Details. Okay. Yep. Just be a, uh, attentive to the details of what we're asking them to do. And um, just playing fast, confident, knowing what to do, executing at a high level, and let the ball, let, let the chips fall as they may. There you go. Alvis Witted. They've got some guys. I'm looking forward to seeing what Dorian Singer can do because – he was so good at Arizona, and then USC last year was kind of a dud for him. So I'm hoping he's more of the Arizona Wildcats version of Dorian Singer versus what we saw with the USC Trojans. I think a lot of the Utah fans are hoping. Well, that. everybody hopes that. Sure, yeah. If you're a Utah <laughs> fan, yeah, you want that because you don't. Yeah, it was, kind of, it was it was truly a dud last year. Yes, what happened in in LA for him? Yes, and I think honestly, I think here arriving at Utah football, he's just arriving in a better situation. Um, look, and and coming into the season. I think the biggest question mark for me for this Utah offense was that wide receipt was the wide receivers. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a lot of questions, um, especially with Devon Vale leaving for the NFL. I had a lot of questions as to who who was going to step up, who was going to emerge as as the top receiver, and you know from what we've been able to hear from from these coaches and what we've been able to see in the short time through this fall camp is it Dorian Singer is playing that part right now. Mm-hmm. And I'm very excited to see what he's able to do on the fields uh, once him and Cam Rising are on the field together uh, week one against SUU. It's my only thing. I wish like, – because I've been on a BYU football practice. We get to watch like 15, 20 minutes of practice. And you at least get a snapshot and get a feel for, okay, how things are looking for the team. Utah's given nothing. Like it would be nice to have just seen Cam Rising and Dorian Singer, see, see the chemistry with them playing out there. That's the one thing I wish – like, even if it were like 10 minutes, just give us a chance to, to glimpse it. But – yeah, the first chance we're going to get to see it is Thursday, uh, August 29th when they take on Southern Utah. So I'm also excited for for Al Ford. Yeah, um, I've heard a lot of good things about him. He's big, by the way. Yeah, I don't know if you, you've probably seen him walking. Seen him walk by. Yeah, I've seen him walk by him. But he, but he's ever like, listen at six six, and I'm like, okay. And we all know this in sports media. Like, there's guys who are listed at a certain height that you're like, all right, that's inflated. I think Damian Alford might legitimately <laughs> like they might be underrating how big he's he's six five at the shortest. He's he's got elite size for that position. I think, you know, I think he's a he's a big body that Utah needed. He's a big body that Utah needed on that yeah. in that wide receiver room. And I think, you know, he is a transfer and there wasn't much, as much talk about him transferring to Utah as maybe a Dorian Singer. So I don't maybe from the outs from people on the outside looking in it it, it they they might forget about Alfred, but I think Alfred can also, if obviously he's able to connect with Cam Rising pretty quickly on off the bat, he might also have a pretty decent season for Utah. Well, he's almost a like for like replacement with Devon Valley. Yeah, like they need that big body receiver that can make plays and we'll give him the opportunity. There's no doubt about that. All right, uh, we will take a time out here. We'll come back on the other side. We'll dive into some of the other topics we have not had a chance to dig into quite yet. Uh, some Utah Jazz news with, news with their schedule coming out this week. We'll delve into that as we call it Five Minutes of, coming up next right here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. Welcome back to the Saturday show right here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. All right, uh, let's get into some of the other stuff going on in sports out there. The Utah Jazz officially announced their 2024-2025 schedule, Alex, and uh, DJ and PK talked about this yesterday. I kind of agree with them. There was like a seven game road trip at one point in the season. There's an eight game homestand. And their thought process was this may be because of the Utah hockey club sharing the venue and having to have a little more of a funky schedule. Your thoughts overall, as we look forward to a Utah jazz season that starts off uh, October 23rd against the Memphis Grizzlies. I think you hit it right on the head. Uh, their schedule is a little bit weird. It's a little odd Just this year. A lot of long road trips. A lot of long road trips. Now, some weird home stands, like you mentioned. Was, well, there's the eight game one right after the All Star break. They come back and they don't. They come home. They come home for the All Star break, and then they don't go back out on the road to like I think like the second week of March or something. It's it's crazy. I just there's some thought of me with. I think the Jazz Utah Hockey Club are kind of telling NHL and NBA, hey. Our building eventually will be able to have the changeover happen very quickly, but until that makeover happens, we're going to have to maybe 
have a little more of a consolidated schedule as it is, like where one team dominates maybe for short stretches of that building. Well, and there are there are moments, um, specifically in like the month of January, uh, in, towards the end of February and in, in March, where you're kind of flip flopping from from the the floor to the ice, from yes. the floor to the ice. Mm-hmm. And so, huge shout out to the Delta Center staff because their work's oh. going to be cut out for them this season. <laughs> they're they're and that and don't forget the concerts. Well, I was going to say, don't forget the concerts. Disney on Ice, Monster Trucks, yeah. Monster Jam, all the different concerts that'll be rolling through. Um, there, there's a lot going on. And by the way. They're adding more and more stuff all the time. Like when you have uh, Kanye West coming in here for one of three listening sessions, the only one in North America, by the way, is here in Salt Lake City. There's some poll going on with the Delta Center, apparently, with some of these artists. Yeah, that also adds to the crazy, crazy schedule. This this Delta Center changeover staff, like the the building maintenance staff, they're definitely going to earn their paychecks this year. You look at the month of January, January 7th, okay. you got a jazz game. January 8th, you got hockey. Then the ninth, you got basketball. Then the tenth, you have hockey. Then the eleventh, you have hockey. Then the twelfth, you have basketball. Then the fourteenth, you have hockey. Then the fifteenth, you have basketball. Then the sixteenth, you have hockey. Just back to back to back to back. And there may be a concert in one of those holes that you, the very few holes that you mentioned in that schedule. There may be a concert one of those nights. I love it because we're. I mean, we're going to have events going nonstop in the Delta Center, but man, that is going to be a lot mm-hmm. going on here across the street this uh, this winter. Um, but to talk a little bit about that schedule, did you see that there's only what three national games? For three the Jazz? national games. I'm not surprised by that at all. Like, uh, let's be real. You got Jazz team. They're in the middle of a rebuild, and yeah, it's. And here's the thing: the national TV broadcasters out there will add games if you deserve it later on in the season. So if the Jazz once again surprise us and decide to jettison parts of the trade deadline but ahead of that they uh, find a way to be competitive they may be rewarded with some extra uh, games but those national tv games are more about the opposing teams than they are about the jazz right now absolutely absolutely and it it you know it's we're in that rebuild we're in that era it's 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 <laughs> it's a weird time uh i just got a friend of ours over at the delta center literally we were talking about the change you ain't kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, my condolences to you and your staff, man. You guys are going to have your work cut out for you. That's the perk of having worked over there for 10 years. I got to know a lot of people in that building. And they this year, it's it's like double and triple. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we just talked about that stretch in January where they're going to be flip-flopping back and forth over and over again. Yes. I, I tip my hat off to them, man. They, they have their work cut out for them. But you're right. On the schedule side of it, the national TV stuff, it doesn't all that surprise me. It just you're looking at this Jazz team, they're going to be one of those teams that talked about, okay, are they going to really j- drop towards the lottery? Because this is a lot of young guys. Now, they did add Patty Mills earlier this week on a one-year deal. Uh, we were talking about on DJ and PK, like, what are they doing with this signing? And David Locke, I think, had a very good point yesterday. You can go back and listen to it. Just search out uh, DJ and PK on your podcast provider. He pointed out the fact that Will Hardy and Patty obviously knew each other from their time in San Antonio together, but you need to have guys, as David pointed out, who have been through all different scenarios in the NBA, and when this likely gets to a point that this team is very near the bottom of the standings, it can get off the rails if you have a bunch of young guys who maybe aren't don't have their heads on straight. Having a guy like Patty Mills, who's 35, who's been through season after season after season, he can be that veteran voice in the locker room saying, guys, focus. Like, yeah. Lock in here. Yeah, and that's that's really all I kind of see from that Yeah, is just being a veteran leader and a veteran voice um, to have in that locker room where you're going to have a lot of youngsters, a lot of guys who are still kind of navigating this league, even mm-hmm. even the t- second-year guys like Keontae. Sure. Yeah. Um, they're still young. They're still young. They're still Some of them are still kids. It, it's Lowry Markinen is the bona fide star on this team. He got rewarded with that massive, massive extension, and I think well deserved. Obviously, he's an he's a NBA All Star caliber player. But beyond him, the other veteran voices in that locker room, and you got John Collins, you got Jordan Clarkson, but those are trade bait right now. So you need to have guys that are going to be around if and when those deals go down to move some of those guys out, that these young guys, yeah, they're going to have to step into leadership roles. You're going to have to have Keontae George speak up a little bit. You're going to have to have those guys eventually move into those roles. But in the meantime, a guy like Patty Mills can be that guy in the locker room saying, guys, this is how it has to be. This is what you got to do. And and also be that 
kind of sounding board for these young players. They're probably getting frustrated at some point, and they're sick of hearing it from the coaches, and they're sick of hearing it from their family and their agent and all this stuff. Well, guess what? They can go over to Patty and say, dude, how do I get through this? And he can be like, all right, here, here's what I did in your situation. That's Yeah, that's the only thing I can see Patty coming in for. I don't see him really even probably maybe even being here longer than a year. Well, and he's getting towards the end of his time as yeah. an NBA player. Uh, the funny thing is Joe Ingles is here for years and always talked about wanting to have played with Patty in, in Utah or somewhere. So after Joe leaves, Patty shows up. <laughs> kind of funny how, how things like that go down. So, uh, yeah, so we'll see. I also want to point out, um, big shout out to Ben Anderson here on The Zone for, yeah. for, mentioning, for pointing out this, this fact. Uh, but over the first 21 games for the Utah Jazz, 17 of them are against playoff contenders. They're going to bury this team so early. The other, th- the other three of the four are against Wembenyama. Oh, great. Awesome. So, so we might be in for a rough start here. So what were we saying? One in 20 start? Uh, I don't know. I, the, here's the thing. Young teams are hot and cold by nature. That's just how it's going to go. This year for this Utah Jazz team is you've got six really young guys, either first- or second-year players that you have drafted in the last two NBA drafts. This year for me, um, you, I want your thought on this. Those six guys, I want to see who comes out. We've already seen Keontae George, I think, make moves. And you're like, all right, that guy, yeah, bonafide NBA rotation piece, could become a starting caliber player in time. I want to see what Taylor Hendricks can do. I want to particularly see what Cody uh, Williams can do. I want to see these young guys go out there – and take their lumps, but there's other nights that they're probably going to shine, and they're going to win some games that you're like, how'd they pull that off? I want to look at guys like Bryce Ensiba, sure, who I, yeah. think, who I think we're still waiting for. He's got a lot to prove. Yeah, I think we're still kind of waiting for him to kind of take over and, and earn his spot. Um, we're looking at guys like Cody Williams, Filipowski, and uh, Collier, who just drafted this year, and see mm-hmm. what, they're, what they're able to bring to the NBA level. Um, I think between all those youngsters – Keontae and Hendricks probably has maybe the most push right now above kind of they're kind of above heads and or excuse me they're kind of heads and shoulders above the other guys um, just due to their performances from last year but Bryce Sensaba for the was drafted last year and I feel like he's the one who has the most proof has the most proof out of all of them yeah and the other thing about this is Lowry obviously will have plenty to prove with the extra money that he's added to his contract <laughs> I'm looking at this, and this is going to take some time for the Jazz to get the balance right. Could they do the sag for flag or the just where they really run towards the top of that lottery? Yeah, it very much looks that way. But what we've been taught the last two seasons in particular is that Will Hardy's a pretty dang good coach, and he gets his guys to play. Absolutely. There's been, there was a couple games last year specifically where, especially early before the trade deadline, where the Jazz probably shouldn't have won. Yeah. But Will Hardy and that coaching staff doing a fantastic. Well, they didn't. They didn't think they were going to win. Yeah, and then <laughs> Will Hardy and that coaching staff do a, a phenomenal job, I think, with with these guys. And right now, I'm still fully on the Will Hardy train. I think he's the perfect guy to lead this project. Yeah, he's doing a really, really fine job. All right, let's flip over to another team that Ryan Smith owns. It's the Real Salt Lake. Uh, now, the summer transfer window. <laughs> Alex holding his heart here, uh, but they have made a flurry of moves now. They transfer Andres Gomez to is it is it Renz? It, how do we say that? Uh, it, it's Renz. I think is in English. Yeah. but I think in French it's Rene. Rene. Okay. Yeah. Well, he's headed to France uh, to play in Ligue 1, as they like to say over there, <laughs> uh, for eleven million dollar transfer fee with the potential of up to two million dollars in add-ons for that biggest. Uh, transfer out in Real Salt Lake history, but they have essentially reinvested it right into this squad, Alex. Absolutely. They, you 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 move on from Andres Gomez, you sell him off for, for a pretty pretty big profit. It's top 10 transfer money-wise in MLS history, by the way. So you lose Andres Gomez. Um, we've we've talked about Fidel Barajas leaving. Brian Oviedo, a veteran on this team, who was waived to make room on that roster to bring in guys like Benji Michelle, who was a former Major League Soccer player who's now back in the league playing for Riasa Lake. Lachlan Brook, who is a young Australian prospect. Javen Brown, who's been in this league for a while um, and and can bring a lot defensively for this team. But the two biggest ones are Diego Consalves out of Benfica, mm-hmm. the new DP. who F- FC Copenhagen is where he was most recently playing, yep. right? Uh, and then Dominic Marchuk, or Martzuk. Still don't know how to pronounce his name. We'll see. We'll figure it out. <laughs> 
We'll learn, we'll learn ahead when he shows up to play because there's some thought that he could be available as soon as next Saturday. And he's he's probably going to be your Gomez replacement. He's a Polish youth international, has played at a pretty high level since he was a teenager, and has had a pretty good run of late. He's a winger, and yeah, he, it feels like you lose Gomez and you bring him in like for like replacement. Diego Gonzalez, uh, you say, is going to be probably that number 10 where – where do you put Matt Brooks now? Guess what? That's what you pay the coaching staff to figure out, okay, what's the combination here? It all gets spearheaded by a Chicho, though. Absolutely. And I think I've I've said this before, and I think that the Consalves uh, signing is probably as big as signing a Chicho Arango. Well, it's the second second most expensive in club history after Chicho because Chicho was reported six million. Gonzalez was three. Is that tra- is that right? Three million. And so they're splashing cash on DP players. And this is something that RSL fans for years, you know this, Alex, you do the RSL show. You probably heard it more than I did. Absolutely. We're going to spend money on this squad. <laughs> well, guess what? They are. So be happy. <laughs> yeah. New ownership, man. It's It's been fantastic. Uh, they, they've really... They've turned this team around, man. This is complete a, a team that's completely unrecognizable from the team that I that we saw two years ago, and they've rebuilt their roster. They they're competing for a Western Conference title this season, and you know we just flipped Andres Gomez, who came in for four million for that eleven million, and brought in great guys who are not only amazing depth, but guys who are going to come in and immediately contribute, like Gonsalves yeah. and like Marchuk and like Lachlan Brook. I think a lot of people are overlooking Brook, and I think he has something special as well. Now he's the Aussie that I uh, want to. He's still waiting for his international transfer and visa and all that stuff. Once these guys all get here, that's going to be the crazy part: is how do you kind of fit them all in? Who gets playing time? Who sees playing time cut? The nice part is, if you look at it from Real Salt Lake's perspective, like, all right, we were pretty thin up front. Well, the attack suddenly looks a lot deeper than it did. Do you remember that LAFC game? Yes. Just uh, oh. not too long ago where we had Justin Glad playing striker? <laughs> Left winger. They had, they had I think, seven defenders on the field yeah. at one point in that game the, the, at different positions, like defensive mid. And, yes, they brought in Justin Glad and put him at, like, left wing. There was so – the options were so thin at that point uh-huh. as far as the attack goes yeah. that we had to resort to defenders coming in to step up and, and – having to fill in those roles yeah. now you don't necessarily have to do that anymore because sure. you have brooke because uh or lachlan um because you have lachlan brooke coming in because you have marcha coming in you have benji michelle gonsalves chicho luna mm-hmm. matt crooks the depth for the offensive side of the ball for Ross lake just got so much better it, it looks that way now can you get the right mix of guys to obviously go out there because they're they're right in the thick of this like i know that they've been off it's a three weeks officially between matches here. They're not back until next Saturday still when they take on San Jose. Now, when ease your way back into MLS play, have the worst team in the West come come to Salt Lake, come to Sandy. That that's a good way to ease back into it. It's a good start. Yeah, it's a good good start. Rouse Lake down the stretch have six of nine at home. Correct. They're playing teams who are under them on the table as far as. Um, the Western Conference goes as far as the Eastern Conference goes. They don't really have any crazy road trips anymore. Yeah. It's a pretty easy schedule for Real Salt Lake. Take advantage of it. Absolutely. Run at the Supporters' Shield. Run at the top of the West here. I know the LAFC, the LA Galaxy, they're all in the mix there. Obviously, in the Eastern Conference, you've got Miami and uh, Columbus, who are also in the Supporters' Shield race. But the best part is, if you're a soccer fan here locally, Real Salt Lake is right in the thick of it right now. If two results go their way, they're right back to the top of the Western Conference. That's how close it is. That's how close it is. So, uh, yeah, next Saturday, San Jose Earthquakes at America First Field. It'll be a 7.30 first kick, and I, for one, am ready to get back to, you know, being I, part I of the broadcast. It. I miss it. I don't know what to do on Saturday anymore. <laughs> My wife's loving it. I'll say that much. She Last was- Saturday, I got home. That had nothing to do, and now this Saturday, I'm like, dude, I, <laughs> what do I do, Brett? Well, here's the thing. This is your really last Saturday. Yeah. Without anything going on. Because guess what? Our sales back next Saturday. The following Saturday is the first weekend of college football. And then it's the what I like to call the marathon run into sprinters pace. It's crazy. It's the best time of the year. Brett just joined our staff. He has no idea what he's in for here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. He has, he has an idea. I, I'll give him that. All right. We will come back on the other side. We'll wrap up this edition of the Saturday show. Coming up next, right here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. Oh, we are 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. 
That can't be his signature. It is. Yeah, have you seen it? Like, have you seen him sign stuff? I have, yeah. Okay, so Andres Gomez, we just talked about him being transferred by Real Salt Lake. He's got the most rudimentary signature I think I've ever seen from a professional <laughs> athlete. Now, it's very legible because it's literally just an A and a G. But, like, there's nothing fancy to it. It's no, just it's an A, a it's literally and a G. A and G. You know what? Maybe simplicity. Maybe I should just uh, props to him. <laughs> wow, it's the most uh, the most unentertaining signature. Now there are a lot of them out there that you're like, I have no idea what this person is writing. My wife lovingly calls my handwriting chicken scratches because I'm <laughs> my handwriting is awful. But th- th- that one, wow, that is that is unique. Yeah, like that's that's kind of like the you know what? Instead of like like just scribbling something over here. I'm going to very clearly, I'm going to put an A and a G there. That's it. <laughs> Props to Andres Gomez, yeah. man. We'll miss him. Yeah. Uh, I hope wish him nothing but success as he heads over to one of the big fives, they call it, in terms of leagues in the world. Because uh, it's an opportunity for him to go and prove himself on the international stage. He had a really, really good run here with Real Salt Lake. 13 goals mm-hmm. to finish the year. Um, incredible run that he had. That he's he, Incredible season he's been having this year for Real. Um, wish him nothing but the best. This will obviously kind of elevate him in the international level, and hopefully he starts getting more looks to to play international football with Colombia. Yeah, that would be fun to see, obviously. All right, uh, so before we go on the show, should we address the elephant in the room, as they say? Yeah, let's do it. All right. This is my last show doing the Saturday show for at least a while. I'm crying. No, don't cry. Uh, It's been really fun, but I am, as most of our listeners know, I do a lot around here, and I work on multiple projects. This has been a really fun thing I've been able to do for quite literally years now. I remember way back when we were over at the now Delta Center was then I think Energy Solutions Arena. It might have been Vivin Arena. I don't remember. It was one of the, one of the two iterations uh, before the Delta Center. And Austin Horton and Adrian Lizer, who are two of our dear friends, were hosting the show and I said, "Hey Hatch, we need you to. Can you come in and fill in?" I'm like, "Great, let's do it." And so they both had things. They moved on in life, and I was like. Well, I don't want to let that thing fall by the wayside because it's a fun th- product to have. It's live programming on Saturday when a lot of it's national, unless we have games going on. I'm like, you know, I'll pick up the baton and run with it. And I did it solo for a while there and made do with what I had. And then we had Michelle come in and be the co-host when she came on board as uh, the Utes Insider for a while there. But it is time to pass the baton on to you guys. So going forward, the principal... Uh, Hosts of the show are going to be Alex and Christian, who have been filling in with me for the last little bit uh, since Michelle uh, moved along. But I'm excited for you guys because this was, and trust me, Lloyd Cole, who's our program director, he did the Saturday show for, show, Saturday show for years as a producer as well. It is an avenue for our younger talent on the station. I call it talent because you guys are all talented. We wouldn't have hired you otherwise. We, we thought you guys were great. It's a chance for you guys to kind of spread your wings and show what you're capable of. Now, that doesn't mean I'll be going far away. I'm still producing DJ and PK. I'm still podcasting. I'm still covering games. I'm still doing BYU and RSL pre-half and post-game shows. I have plenty on my plate. I will still be around, though, on this show. I'll be checking in from time to time. You guys want to talk some BYU Cougars? Call me up. We'll have Steve Bartle, uh, who, are, who is our new Utah Utes insider, also uh, checking in from time to time as well. So... Don't be sad because it happened. Be happy. Be- What's that phrase? I'm butchering this. Don't be sad that it's over. Be happy because it happened. Thank you, Brett. That's what it was. Yes. That was amazing. I butchered that so badly. But it's been, it truly, it's been a fun, fun ride. The other fact of the matter is, I'm a dad. I've got three kids. I need to be a dad a little bit more at times. So, you know what? I'll be around and... Don't be surprised if I pop up from time to time on the Saturday show. But it's going to be your guys' baby moving forward here, and I have got nothing but uh, love for you two as you move forward. I'm Brett and the crew who will also be helping produce. Guess what? It's your guys' baby now, so take it and run. All right? I'm so stoked. I'm so <laughs> stoked. And I'm, I wish Christian was here to share this moment with us, but I'm, we're, we're both incredibly, incredibly excited to to have the opportunity to kind of take over the Saturday show, make it ours. And we hope for you, the listeners, we can continue to bring entertainment on Saturday mornings and you guys can continue listening on and, 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 and support the show. And for Jake, thank you so much for the opportunity. Absolutely. And we'll miss you, man. Okay. I've only got one request. 
keep technical fouls going. Oh, we will. Technical fouls predates, I think, Lloyd and myself. Like we, we, Lloyd and I are old dogs, as as it were, in the radio. That technical fouls bit has been around forever. It's just, one of my favorites. Just keep it going. It's one of my favorites. That's, that's, that's my only request. You can screw with the entire format of the rest <laughs> of the show. I don't care. I, that's my only request is keep technical fouls going because I'll be listening and I want to hear more about the stupid things in sports. Because Absolutely. Because we talk a lot about different things, but there's some buffoonery out there that needs to be called out from time to time. Absolutely. That's one of the things that we will continue to carry on here. Uh, we'll obviously continue to carry on the highlight of the week, but we'll, we'll plan some stuff and we'll, yeah. we'll make it... We'll we'll make it ours just a little bit, and we'll, like I said, we hope we can continue bringing the best and most entertaining sports news here on the KSL Sports Zone. So, Clinto Pete, relax. <laughs> R E L A X, as um, good, our good friend Aaron Rodgers said once upon a time. <laughs> Saturday show is not going anywhere. It's just changing format a little bit. So, with that. For my last time, at least for the time being, for Alex and Brett, I'm Jake. A big thank you to all of you for tuning into the Saturday show. Uh, keep it right here on the KSL Sports Zone all week long for the best coverage of everything going on in the sports world. And of course, come back next Saturday for a new iteration of the Saturday show right here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. Take the zone with you wherever you go. Download the KSL Sports app to get live streaming of your favorite shows. Download.